coming for our discussion of why all news is local news. So I'm going to introduce our panelists. We have Jeff Barnd. You want to come up? Um, uh, Jeff Barnd is the ACMI News Director since 2018. He's a 113-time Emmy Award recipient in television news broadcasting, including three Emmys for news writing and one Emmy for Best Anchor in Boston. And he uh, is also a weeknight anchor in Boston, Baltimore, and Portland, Maine markets. Welcome. Everywhere, everywhere. Thank you very much. Yeah. Good to be here. Um, we also have Bob Spray. Come on up founder, editor, and publisher of Your Arlington. Thanks for coming. And we have Crystal Haynes, award-winning journalist, Boston 25 News Weekend Morning anchor and reporter with nearly 20 years of broadcast experience. So thank you for our panelists. All right, so we're gonna, this is a question to everybody, but I'm just wondering why did you go into journalism? We can start with Bob and then go down the line. That's funny. Uh, <laughs> I went into journalism on uh, April Fool's Day, 1970. I walked down the street in Bethlehem, Pennsylvania, and uh, walked into the Bethlehem Globe Times and asked for a job. And what do you know? They gave it to me. Um, I just want to say that uh, on my first day of work, uh, I turned in a police story at 1.30 in the afternoon. This was an afternoon paper. And the uh, city editor looked up at me and said, we got deadlines, you know. <laughs> if you don't know, yeah. <laughs> newspapers operate under deadlines. And uh, I had missed it by a few hours. <laughs> <laughs> but you were accurate. <laughs> there you go. That's it. There you go. You had it down. Um, so my story is a little different. Uh, so we, we uh, in third grade, we had to watch the news every night and do a hundred word summary. And so I fell in love with watching the news that way. And so I said, I made a, de I made a declaration at Thanksgiving that year. And I said, I'm going to be a journalist and um, would decided I was gonna, never have thought about doing anything ever since. And then there was a citywide riding contest for uh, the Springfield Union News and Sunday Republican, which is now like Mass Live here. Um, and so they had like a teen section, and it was like you were it was like middle school through high school. And so I thought my first paying job was as a teen beat reporter. Um, for the Springfield Union News, and then I fell in love with television production. And uh, my first like uh, TV job that where I was professional was uh, I went to Emerson College, and as some of you may know, it's extremely expensive, and I paid for it by myself. So I was I nice. wanted to get it Very done good. in three years. So I was like, I'm gonna do as many internships as I can, and I got a job in Springfield, where I'm from, the GB, WGGB. Um, at Channel 40, which I think is something else now, and um, five people quit in one day. And they were they turned to me and they're like, you seem like you have some aptitude. Do you want to be assignment desk manager? And I said, all right. <laughs> so junior year of college, I got my first TV job, and uh, the rest is history. So. Very, very good. <laughs> uh, I always wanted to do anchor, or I, I wanted to basically do play-by-play -play for ice hockey, for NHL. Mm -hmm. I come from the Philadelphia area, and... Um, I went to school. My father was very, very conservative. And look, I know you want to go to broadcasting, but at the time there were only three stations, ABC, NBC, CBS. And I want you to have something to fall back on. So I got my marketing degree from what is now Jefferson University College. When I went there, it was Philadelphia College of Textiles and Science. So I have a degree in marketing and, and um, organic chem minor. But I always wanted to, I, I figured, okay, now I have the degree. I want to I want to do sports play by play. And I was just sitting with a friend in the office as I was selling airtime in my first radio uh, gig in Atlantic City, New Jersey. He said they're having tryouts for the anchor position at the NBC affiliate, little tiny sandbox TV station in Atlantic City. They're only paying seven or ten dollars for a half an hour to compliment the female anchor. Mm -hmm. So I figured, all right, I'll, I, I'm, I sell during the day. That's my salary. I want to get it. That's that's the, my foot in the door. So. Um, I tried out for the job and got it because I think I was the only one to take it because it was only ten dollars a, a and that was before taxes. <laughs> and so I got the job and um, I'm still waiting to do play-by-play -play for, <laughs> for for ice hockey forty years later. So that's how I got into it. 
That's great. So from our very beginning as a nation, local journalists have played a vital role in both educating us and building community. They've been the foundation of the American free press and political mm -hmm. democracy. Abundant research in recent years has found that strong local journalism builds social cohesion, encourages political participation, and improves the eff efficiency and decision making of local and state government. I'm sure you would all agree. But where do you see local journalism in the age of social media? Mm -hmm. Want to start, Crystal? Mm -hmm. So I think, so I think um, there there is a tension right now where um, we are both fight we are accepting social media in in one way and fighting against it in another, and I think that social media technology is not going away. We cannot legislate it away. We cannot, you know, gripe at it away. Uh, we have to work with it and use it. We have to regulate it if necessary, and then we have to use it as a tool because a lot of times the lowest barrier of, um, uh, like it, it, it tends, to, a lot of times it's the lowest barrier to entry for people to get their news. Not everyone um, has a television at home. Not everyone has the ability to um, even be able to consume a new, like a, a newspaper and read at a level where they can understand it. I have been in, in, in places where the New York Times has been, have been literally incomprehensible to communities because of the literacy rate in that community. And so social media tends to be this, this place where people feel like they can get their news easily. It's one or two minutes. Usually it's very simple and it feels like so like someone isn't talking down to them. And so I think we have to have a com we have to have a more robust conversation about how we integrate it in a way that feels natural. Because a lot of times, and I have this conversation with my news uh, room all the time where it feels like we're doing newscasts only on Twitter or like newscasts on TikTok, and that's not what TikTok is. So um, I think there has to just be a better bridge in communication and and frankly creativity to get to bring the news to, to this different platforms. And I think it's easy to do if we make a conscious choice as a society and also as a, as a news industry to use it as a tool for disseminating information rather than trying to compete with it. Great. Um, this is a question for everyone, but how has the 24 hour news cycle changed journalism? Oh, good Jesus. Lord. <laughs> uh, we're sleeping over. Uh, this, this continues. Uh, it's, it's changed it completely. I remember, uh, I started in 1982 in the summer of 82 when we had the big three, uh, networks. And I remember, um, in college in 1979 or 1980, when CNN said, we're going to go 24 seven, uh, Bobby Batista started in 1980. Mm -hmm. 1980. And it was a joke. I mean, no one thought that there's there's not enough room uh, for, for all that news and to be doing that 24-7. And they found a way to do it, rather by formula, really. They, they would have a, a news story for two or three minutes, and then, okay, joining us now are the two analysts who are going to take care of the next 13 minutes mm -hmm. until we go to a break from, you know, with this word from Tide. And it worked. And now you have Fox, you have MSNBC, you have all these choices in, in which to make, but 24-7 news changed everything, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. I think that that's absolutely true. And I also think, uh, we were just talking about social media, that also changed it. Because not only oh, do gosh, you have yeah. to create content that lives in a 24-hour cycle, all your newscasts, you also have to tweet twice a day, you have to post to Instagram, you have to post to Facebook, sometimes you have to do a Facebook Live. Sometimes you have to, We uh, Periscope was like connected to Twitter and you had to stream while you were doing your live shot at the same time. And so it's not only that, but like it's like this 360 and then it's 24 hours a day. And I think it changed just the way that we um, consume the news completely because news, you know, the news used to be appointment television. Like it was like six o'clock, you sat down, that was the news. You read the newspaper in the morning mm -hmm. and true. you had all that time as journalists to gather and then put that out. And so I think it's, it completely changed the landscape. Social media is a source for me. Mm -hmm. um, social media was emerging in 2006 when I decided to, to start uh, your Arlington. But uh, the beginning of your Arlington also has to do with a trend that was going on uh, in America in general, where uh, traditional newspapers were declining, mm -hmm. uh, larger newspapers were declining, and there was all this other internet-related uh, media landscape 
emerging. Uh, so um, it, it goes both ways with social media. I, I, I watch it relentlessly for what people are saying. Uh, most of it is without solid basis in fact. Mm -hmm. uh, jur journalists still have to operate from a basis of, a, of agreed to information and fact. And uh, as we went along, Are you sure about that? <laughs> it's a good question. Uh, it, it it is an ongoing goal. Is it is it uh, uh, always realized in the way that you would want it? Probably not. But you do the best you can with the facts that you have, with the sources that you have that are good sources that can provide that information. I see 24-7 uh, news and also the, the websites and, and, and social media. It's just changed the entire landscape to the point that, and as you said, it was appointment television. Mm -hmm. uh, television was in control. It was a one-way street. Now it's the viewer and the reader who has the power. I'm Okay, I want to read this right now. I want to find out what's happening on Twitter or whatever. And it's just changed everything. The thing that I'm surprised with, when I see, um, even in television news, uh, social media, the number of errors mm. that I've seen in a story into getting the story and to getting your uh, first and, and second source in order to secure the story and then put it out there has just waned. And I see recklessness today that would not be tolerated 30 years ago. I'm not saying that news was better 30 years ago. It's just that everyone's need to get it out there and the immediacy of the, the medium that you're using. Uh, that's being accurate is secondary in, in many cases. And I'm thinking, my gosh, they every now and then they'll come on and apologize you know i i own that sorry uh, good night everybody and then the next day they're right there nothing and it's like wow mm -hmm. it's changed so i don't know it's always evolving though yeah you guys kind of led into my next question this is perfect i, I is knew that i, I read your question it, list before i, I came ask, up here when is a story ready to publish mm. <laughs> well we're good with the democratic convention in 68. Right. That's, I think we have that nailed down. So right. that, that's all right. That's, uh, when you get your sources, when you're absolutely sure, I can't stand uh, the uncertainty and I'll hold back. I know a lot of people don't, but I'll hold back. And I've had many, I've, I've had loggerheads with news directors, executive producers. I'm not ready for the story. Well, you know, we have two sources and there have been times where that station that I work for in Baltimore, for instance, they've been burnt. and and. Those were the same people who put a story on prematurely. And I always, I fought for a story, some some I lost. Um, but it's, as you know, mm -hmm. it's your face up there. Mm -hmm. It's not theirs. They're making the decision. And if I'm not comfortable with it, they're going to know it. So a lot of people, they'll go with a story and uh, devil may care and just hope that it's right. And so I like to get two or three sources. I like to hear from the horses, but even a credible source, if I get one, I'll, call, I'll try to call another source directly involved with whatever story it is, just to corroborate what they're saying. Mm -hmm. So, um, not perfect. There have been times where, uh, you know what, we came in third on that story, but you know what, we're, we don't have to apologize. We don't have to retract anything. And um, that to me is more important than getting a story out first. And I think that the one thing is, you know, I also teach at Northeastern and like I asked the students, I was like, because they're eager young journalists, although even that's changing for what it looks like for them. But they were like, I was like, does it really matter to you if a station got it first? And they're like, no. Mm -hmm. They're like, we don't care because they're not no like no one's sitting there. Like, I think the concept of who's getting it first came from when we were sitting there at six o'clock and we were like, oh, channel five got it before seven. But like no one sits and watches a newscast anymore. They're run, they're doing other things or they're streaming it or they're listening to it on the, you know, on, on whatever device that they're using. And so I, I think that that piece of it is, is less important. I think what I also struggle against is like, you know, our morning show is six and a half hours. It's from four 30 in the morning to 11 AM. And the wheel and, and and filling that content i find is where the most error where you see more, the most errors because it's like the producers are turning out you know a documentary every morning <laughs> and they're making mistakes and you know and you're anchoring it and you're in it because you're in it, you're trying to both preserve your energy but also be into the read and you're like 
that what I just read, I don't think was right. That mm. doesn't make any sense. Or three stories back, like we said something else. Or like, and then that's why I find that you see the most errors. So I think when you're talking about like, is the story ready? I think the I think now the 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 conversation is like, okay, even if we are putting out a developing news, right? That's our we call it scapegoat or like our, our like cover is um, developing news. So this is what we know and we timestamp things. And I think there's a way to do that um, well. And I'm so thoughtful of, you know, we're up at the 10 year anniversary of the uh, marathon bombing. Jeez. I covered that in real time when that was happening and the weeks after that. And it was like the, the, the hunger for new information. People were putting out anything to the point where people were being arrested where they shouldn't have been. And like, like even the police were eager to just jump on anything. And so, um, like I'll never forget in Watertown, um, we were like two streets over for when Johar Sarnayev was in that boat and, uh, you know, SWAT team was there and people were like, you know, standing at this lawn and we were all going live from the same place. And we were getting information from their P public information officer directly. And we were only tweeting and saying the information that we knew that we had confirmed because the stakes couldn't have been higher, right? Mm -hmm. We had people come out of their house and go, you know, I just saw on Twitter <laughs> that this is what happened. And you should be saying that on TV. Like, I don't know what you're doing here, but like I could be doing your job. Multiple people <laughs> coming out of their house because they're they're watching. And then and at the same time- You need that on top of everything, right. yeah. And the police are like, uh, you need to be in your house. <laughs> these like these people here, we have enough like SWAT team, FBI officers to like manage this because people need to know this information. But we don't need you to come out your house and tell these people what they're doing. Like I will never forget a guy in full like SWAT battle gear was like had to tell this lady, uh, ma'am, you need to be in your house right now, not telling this reporter what to do. <laughs> never forget it. And so and I it, it but that's the way people like people will think that they can do your, your job better than you can. And like even so you, even when you hold back a story, they're like Where were you? Where were you? Oh like I, I read this on Facebook because my cousin's <laughs> aunt's cat's dog said this and this now I already had that information. Well how many donuts people. did you make today at your place? Right, exactly. <laughs> it's it and it's it's wild. Yeah. That's a great job of explaining to the public how difficult it is right. what we do. I remember the Boston bombing. I was in Baltimore when it happened, and I'm sitting at my desk, a cubicle, and the assistant news director came in, and he was blustered. He said, who knows anything about Boston? I said, I, <laughs> I, 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 said, I worked up there for nine years, and I, I left Boston to get my old CPAC and, and um, the uh, Baltimore station. I said, I do. He said, get on the set. Uh, what happened? Just get on the set. I'll tell you in your IFB, your earpiece. I'll just mm -hmm. tell you. And it's like, get on the set. No scripts, no nothing. And it's like, okay. Uh, and I'm sitting there and turn the monitor around. My co-anchor hadn't been in yet. And just talk and lead into uh, Barack Obama was making some speech uh, right after that. And uh, he was a little late that mm -hmm. day. So he was stretch. But uh, for me, when you had a breaking story, I never wanted to pretend to anyone that I knew more than they did. Mm -hmm. So it's like, and I would say on the air, we are going to learn together. I'm looking at this in real time as you are. I, I know a little bit about the Copley Place. And if you recall, JFK had an explosion, JFK Library. That's right. Mm -hmm. Had an explosion that day and they thought, and so we're going to JFK Library and thank God I was there. I knew a lot about that. Uh, we were right on Morrissey Boulevard when I anchored in uh, Boston. But I, I don't pretend to know any more, and I don't want to put out, I, I don't want to speculate. I just want to say this is what we're looking at. They're looking for the, the, uh, the suspects. They shut down the city, basically. Mm -hmm. uh, that's all we know. We're going to have more tonight at uh, 6 and 11 and the morning show and 12 and all that other stuff. So um, you just roll with it. And you're always going to be criticized. Oh, you my just, God. Please. And, uh, and I just worked the local angle because we had Crystal Campbell. Uh, mm. was an Arlington resident who mm. was killed. Mm. Oh, geez. And uh, that information I got from a variety of sources, including police. And uh, I did know where she lived, but uh, it, I, I didn't know any relatives. However, I will say uh, at the time, I was a partner with Inside Medford, a, a website that no longer exists. And the uh, editor of Inside Medford was a personal friend of the Campbell family. Mm -hmm. So I did get information that way. And that's why all news is local. Mm -hmm. There you go. 
nice yeah. tie in. Very good. There you go. <laughs> I was going to say that, Crystal, but I'm glad you did. <laughs> Your SWAT comment also. I have a, my fa one of my favorite restaurant bars, the Druid. I don't know if everyone's been there. They they never shut down. I was talking to the guy there. He's like, we never ever shut down. They did not shut down the day. The boss said, don't shut down the day of the wow. marathon, even though the bombing that even though they were all supposed to be shut down. And a SWAT team came up to the guy was like, finally a SWAT team came up and was like, get like you gotta yeah. go. Like this yeah. is not happening. Jeez. All right, back to wow. our <laughs> questions. Um, so yeah, back to some local news. So as you mentioned, many local newspapers around the country and local locally as well have been shutting down and it's harder and harder to get these local newspapers and these local news sources. So what do you believe can be done to strengthen local professional journalism and tighten its connection to its communities? Mm. Can I answer? Yes, yeah. please. Yeah. I'm doing it. Um, <laughs> So. Whether people agree with what I do uh, is the best thing that I could do or not. Uh, my aim is to do just what, just what you're talking about. And uh, here's, here's where I get to rag on the advocate. Because I used to be the editor of the advocate in the 94, 95. Uh, we won some prizes. Uh, we were owned then by Fidelity Investment Company. Mm. Uh, which immediately cut our health benefits uh, after they own, owned the company. And they also started measuring the, uh, our offices at Five Water Street, uh, where we used to be. Um, why were they measuring? They wanted to find out uh, where they could find real estate elsewhere. And two years later, they were gone. Uh, the advocate is no more. And to bring it to present, the advocate really is no more because it is uh, the advocate and star as of last uh, May. And if anyone happens to pick up the paper, I was a subscriber for 30 years, um, there's nothing in it. And uh, the, my whole aim in pursuing your Arlington since 2006 has been to build it into a, a reporting uh, outlet for Arlington, and we're doing it. I, I read it all every day. I read what you write every day. You steal stuff? I steal my, you, have, you think I work? <laughs> I'm at the Heights Pub, Bob. You're just, <laughs> <laughs> Bob, you're doing a good job. <laughs> no, I read, yeah, because, I mean, you're plugged in, and quite obviously, mm -hmm. I think Arlington's lucky to have somebody like you. Mm -hmm. I'm not saying that because sure. you're here, and I've said that before, even outside of your presence, but seriously, you 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 have your uh, ear to the ground, you know what the, you know, the players mm -hmm. are? And for and me, it's interesting because I came from a commercial uh, background, commercial television background, working for an affiliate uh, in, in uh, Boston, uh, Washington, uh, Philly, as a reporter, and, and, and Baltimore. This is my first foray into ACMI, and it's marvelous. It's like a breath of fresh air, and uh, it's, it's wonderful. Why is that? I'm sorry? Why is that? Why is it? I, I, think, it's, I think it is because it's, it's one town. You get to know the players very well, not just... In, in passing and there are so many stories in this town um, and I'm an outsider I, I'm originally from Jersey but I, had, I took a crash course in Arlington and the public here is very engaged politically and with uh, many issues that are going on around town with town meeting coming up in just the next few days and it's a pleasure to work here it's refreshing um, I'm, it's not like a, a scrum yeah I mean, I, when Trump was arrested, I was looking at those reporters across from the tower, and I'm thinking, oh, thank God I'm not doing that anymore. I mean, that's what I used to do. And it's like, how do you feel? You know, 40 million people <laughs> with 18 million mic flags. And you're getting something of really of little substance, if nothing, uh, under those circumstances. And here, it's, it's, you take some deep dives into stories, and thank God they give me the time to put some stories together. And um, I, I, I like the stories I do here. I, I don't want to do anything else. It's a perfect way to round out my career. I'm, I'm very happy here. So... But um, yeah, the, the way things have changed, uh, I think there is a need. I, I also wanted to say, I don't want to get ahead of you, but I also wanted to say there's, when you have like one quarter of the papers have dried up since 2005, but you're finding new ways to get the word out. And you're and so it's it spurs creativity. And I think you're onto something here. I think that's going to be the future. Mm -hmm. I think so too. And I also think, I just think, it, and, and I have this whole soapbox where I talk about the importance of local television, why local TV stations are 
probably the most important part of yeah. news gathering that exists um, in a free democracy. And you can just, and a tribute to that is a high school football game and covering a high school football game. Because that, like, like that, like, and I'll say, it, because I think like what you're doing uh, with your Arlington, ACMI, I think this is an engaged community. Like I've been in other communities where they're less engaged. And so that's, a, uh, it makes it a little bit harder, but I just think it just needs a rebranding. If that may, like, like the way that we put energy and money and focus into other things to pivot it so that it can be more um, appetizing to the masses. I think that that's what local TV needs to, but the problem is, is there's a stubbornness in newsroom. And I'm sure that you came across this where it's like, we got to do this differently. Like we can't chase the big national stories. That's not what we do here. That's right. We need to do what we do well and where what we can offer that CNN and MSNBC and all the others cannot offer our community because they'll come to us for that. Mm -hmm. They'll come to us. But we keep like, especially in, in Boston, we keep chasing these stories like if we're big national players. And I'm like, we're going to lose every time because people will turn to CNN and see it at you know, the time we're off air, where if we really dial in and, and, and pay attention to storytelling, I have this conversation every single day about why a 90 second story can, unless told in a very precise way, cannot is not as valuable to our local viewer as a well done three minute story yeah. that involves a community. And you and, have to fight for that time. And you have to fight for the time. And for what? Like people will sit and watch it if it's a good story. Yeah, like you know what I mean? So anyway, so I think I think when we're talking about like like local TV, I just really think the energy and investment, like I like what ACMI is doing where like you've probably seen other public access television stations. Yeah. They are not as sophisticated or organized or or thoughtful. I mean, they've tried, but it's yeah. not the same. It's not the same kind of thing. So I think if if the energy and the focus was put into local TV, pivoting it into a way where it is more focused on what viewers and communities want, not focus groups that consultants out of Indiana decide are mm -hmm. what viewers want. I think that it not only will survive, I think it'll thrive. Exactly and right. I think that that's exactly what we, and, and I would uh, challenge you all, our job is a supply and demand business. If you demand coverage in a certain way, we have to supply that because our advertising dollars come from the folks in the community who are selling like, you know, like Jeep Ford is going to advertise on the station that has the most eyeballs. And so if you're watching a station that's giving you the thing that you want, then then that's where our, the advertising dollars will follow. Like I think of during the pandemic, public television and NPR and during the Trump years that ended up being I mean, you know, we all know what happened to NPR recently with with Twitter and stuff like that. But it's like that it that's a direct supply and demand people funded public television and radio because they liked the way they told stories that I, needs to happen in local commercial television i always got uh anchoring in baltimore for 20 years the first eight minutes are depressing mm -hmm. it's just the same yep. thing it's yep. just the crashes it's all, yeah, Fires, yeah, that's all murder. it is. Uh, Drive-bys, drugs, uh, it's just awful stuff. And then finally, as I'm anchoring this, I'm thinking, I'm wondering if the viewers feel this way, because I do. We would have what's known as a cover story. Yeah. We'd go to a commercial break, have a second block of news, which was basically national and international news, go to a commercial break, cover story at 1030, it was an hour show. And then we'd run our cover story, which was an in-depth four-minute report. And I lived for that. And a lot of anchors don't like going out and reporting. And I loved it because it would drive me crazy sitting there in front of my computer all day. So I'd go out and I'd really try to find a story. So and basically they would say, if, man, if you want to go do a story, what do you want to do? Just do it. Don't curse on the ear. That's all we tell you to yeah, do. But, yeah. Okay, and then you do it. And um, that that's what I really enjoy doing. I really lived for that cover story. Mm -hmm. So yeah, if you could tell a story and it moves and it's a really compelling story, why not go past a minute 15? Right. So. All right, so um, we've seen a great partisan divide in our nation. How does this exist in our local news sources and where do you see it coming up? You wanna start, Brock? <laughs> um, how to say this? Um, I, I have my critics and they show up on social media. Mm. And I'm not going to name any 
If anyone is out there on Patch Neighbors, they will see it. Uh, and the um, motivation seems to be from the right to make it seem that whatever I'm reporting must be questioned. So it, it really comes back to uh, the attitudes that uh, that came to the fore during the Trump administration, uh, where uh, facts and truth were questioned. And uh, your question was, how do I deal with that? Um, not very well. <laughs> no. I don't think anybody could. I, yeah. I said, what do you do? Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, you have you have the credibility behind you and the longevity, and mm -hmm. that will be except it's questioned constantly. Yeah, but that beats keyboard courage. Any, uh, uh, you know, you're going to have your numb nuts who are going to go, "Oh yeah, he's right." You know, <laughs> all two of them uh, uh, from mommy's basement. Yeah. Um, but uh, you know, you have it, it's tough, and especially now. See, I got out of it four years ago. You're now in the th you're in the trenches. Yeah. yeah. And it's interactive. I mean, if someone got mad at you 30 years ago uh, for something you said, it wasn't wrong. They just didn't like the way you said it. You'd get a hard letter. Yeah. And I'm thinking, boy, that took a lot of, a lot of, you know, put the stamp on it and send it. And I got like two. Um, but now it's real easy. Yeah. Oh, I don't like what you're wearing. I don't like. Your, yeah, I, I don't that. like this. I don't. Is that a toupee, Jeff? Is that a you know? Yeah. And I would say yes. Yeah. Uh, well, it's like but, I did a story about. So, um, Boston Twenty Five is uh, owned and operated by Cox Media Group. Uh, it was owned and operated by Fox. And about seven years ago that's when we were purchased by Cox Media Group. And they were like, we're not, and that's a, it's a company that is out of Atlanta. And so they were like, we're not doing none of this anymore. And so there was a whole change of that. So I was there the whole time and I had made my work, what I do personally easier because I was the one that was saying this language is inappropriate and I'm not going to say that on TV and like that kind of stuff. And I didn't, people always go, why didn't you leave? And I go, because if I left, there would be no one left. And no one knows, like, and so for me, it was like the representation was extremely important. And now, you know, 12 years at that station, I feel it's even more important. And so I think the hard part about that is, um, especially in the last four years, people, my stories specifically, I tend to do a lot of stories, you know, in the equity space. And uh, I did a story in um, Black maternal health, and I use the term birthing people. You would have thought, what, what term? Birthing people uh -huh. instead of mother. You would have thought I went to someone's house personally and set it on fire. Birthing people are mothers and this and that. And like, I'm not going to go into spend another 90 seconds to explain to you, well, what about surrogates? And what about these people? What about these people? Or whatever, because that wasn't the point of the story. The point of the story was this legislation that was out. And, you know, and, and frankly, this point of the story was the, the, um, death rates among uh, women and uh, birthing people in the United States, the most, ri the richest country in the world. And we have a birth, we have a death rate among people who are having babies um, that's worse than Uzbekistan and Mexico and things like that. So that's the story. But it was like, and every day it's like that. It's like, I'll use the term Mel King who I had the pleasure of, be, of having one of the last interviews he, he gave. Mm -hmm. And I said, and I had said, you know, he'd led these protests, these tent city protests and stuff like that. And people were like, those are riots. If the liberals can call those protests that, and, and, and call what we did, you know, January 6th a riot, then this and that. And it's just like, come on. And so, it, you know, it's like all of these kind, of, and it's every single day. It's a lot of like when I do stories, um, I always do these stories where I, I did a story today about Black Men Run Boston, which is a, a chapter of a national association that uh, engages Black men specifically in brotherhood and fellowship. And they run in Roxburgh, Dorchester, and Mattapan every Saturday and Sunday. And it's it's to increase uh, running visibility for people of color in Run running uh, from the U.S., not the folks who are from Africa. And I did the story and they're like, oh, 
well, if we did a story about white men run, you wouldn't do that story. And it was every time, every single time. And so I think the oh, I think for me, the thing is, is like, I, you know, just continue to keep doing that work. And, um, and you know, the people who want to see it and the people who need to see it will find it. But it is, it, it's difficult to navigate because, and this is where I'm actually get to your question because I'm rambling a little bit, is <laughs> when you have management that gets nervous about those comments. And that has happened to me before. Whereas I did a story about, I don't know if you guys are familiar with the sociological concept called um, missing white woman syndrome, which is extremely well documented. But it's like, it's basically that if a wealthy or good looking white woman goes missing, she'll get tons and tons of stories, news coverage. But if it's a, poor immigrant or a black woman or a woman of color get next to no coverage. And so the um, Columbia uh, Journalism Review actually did a study on this and they have this interactive thing about, and it, you put your information, it'll tell you how many news stories you are worth. And it'll, and it's a really stark, like, that's, that's really a good idea. It's really well done. I remember Natalie Holloway, remember her yes. in Aruba? Yes. Man, it was all over the place. Over and the I'm thinking, you know, there's a lot of missing kids everywhere. Everywhere. Uh, Natalie, and say, how many calls do you get into a newsroom about missing kids? Like, oh, oh so, we go, and you know what? Yeah. That was one of the greatest parts of my job. I love writing. I like yeah. doing what I do. I like telling you a good story, but man, getting the bad guy every now and then yeah. or finding somebody who's missing, yep. they come into a lobby. They're just crying. Yeah. And it's like, yeah, we could slip 20 seconds in. Sure. We'll yeah. show the picture. We have a picture. That that really was a good feeling, and sometimes I mean we had a pretty good audience in uh, in Baltimore and also Boston. Yeah. Um, and yeah, you that that's when it really really works. It's it's yeah. it's a lot of fun. But so with this thing, you know, with this story, I the missing Cohasset mother, gorgeous mm -hmm. woman. Oh yeah. Yeah. Beautiful house, nice community, and there was a people who were advocating for black and brown women who are missing were using that opportunity. And what I mean by using is being like, well, what about these missing? This woman has been missing for uh, five months and she's got five kids and not three. And like she, you know, there's a woman in East Boston who's still missing. But she's an immigrant that is not an English language, native English language speaker. And so I did a, a story about that about while we are, all, you know, all eyes are descended upon this wealthy community of Cohasset, there are thousands of missing black and brown women. Their cases do not get the police presence that they do, that I pulled in the Columbia Journalism Review data and things like that. My news director flipped out. This is insensitive. And because I also fill in at um, GBH and uh, Greater Boston. So I did a whole segment on this. And she's like, this is insensitive. And, you know, you ca you cover the Cohasset story as well. And, you know, this family is this is a tragedy and this and that. And I go and I said to her, it's a tragedy for the other families as well. And so the the folks and, and yes, no one can everyone. It's a tragedy all around. But I'm going to tell you, this woman in Cohasset has gotten the resources or the, like that story has gotten the resources it needs. The stories that aren't being told are the ones we need to have a conversation about. And it is not a this or that. It's and. And so when you and, the, and I think the hard part is when the criticism, because of course you get all of the, the folks who, 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 who talk about it on uh, social media, comment on social media. The problem is, is when your managers get shook and they think about that in terms of advertising dollars and, and they think you, about. Yeah. You're on the tightrope by yourself. Then. Yeah. And nobody's yeah. backing you. Your yeah. executive producer is not backing you. They're concerned yeah. about the dollars. We, we can't we can't shake it up. Yeah. You know, we got to please the stockholders. Yeah. And, and that's it's like, when no, we got to get a story is what stories. we got to do. Yeah. 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 I agree. Mm -hmm. Great. I just have a few more questions as we're starting to run out of time and then we'll take a few questions. I thought we were audience. here overnight. <laughs> uh, this is a big pivot, but I'll talk faster. Um, it's something quite a question we get here a lot. But how can someone learn more about town elections? Oh, okay. Very That's big pivot. <laughs> town elections. Yeah. I start publicizing uh, traditionally started publicizing the town election in early December when uh, people take out nomination papers to run. And that's that's the first step in in the process. Um, uh, this year I waited till January, but early January I was I I was on it. And the the, the fact is the incumbents took out papers on December eighth, the first day they uh, they could. So there there wasn't much going on. But 
it turned out there was uh, uh, contested elections. And uh, I simply uh, began reporting it as early, early as possible. And still, right up to the time of the election, you get people say, I, oh, there's an election? Oh, mm -hmm. So I, I do what I can, but I can't do everything. I admire you all, because Arlington is a special place in terms of like town elections and town meetings. It's and very New England. Town meeting. Yeah. yeah, yeah, it's yeah. very New England. And per periodically people will say, you know, we're a city, we should become a city and have mm -hmm. a different form of government. And yet, yet there are plenty of people in town who don't agree with that and they want to want to keep it a town. It's a, it's a tradition. And it's also a learning experience for me. Yeah. I, I, I always worked in cities where they had mayors, city councils. Yeah. And uh, coming here, it was like, well, this is cool. You know, town meeting and everybody meets at the auditorium. And the and and it's funny because when I first moved here, and I don't know if you had this experience, I was like, how come they don't have overnight parking here? That's yeah. just, <laughs> cozy, right? I know. Most of my father-in-law already told me. And I was like, so I just right so I just used my reporters. like, it's, So I just called up you know, the, the um, clerk, and I was like, so so how does this work? If you want to put it as an agenda item, you know, like how does that work? If she mm -hmm. went, oh, honey. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome to Arlington. She's like, no, no, no. And I was like, oh, okay. When was that? It was, well, I moved, I moved to Arlington um, with my husband, uh, because my husband's family has been here for five generations. Um, three years, three or four years okay. ago. Okay, because there was a, there was a, a referendum in 2013. That, really? Uh, and people favored keeping overnight. Uh, parking restrictions. Oh, really? Yeah. Yeah. Really? Jeez. Mm -hmm. Huh. Interesting. So, just let it go. Just, let it go. just deal, with, <laughs> deal with the drop, tandem drop parking. What? <laughs> what are we dropping? <laughs> All right. This is my last question. How do you guys get your news? What are your favorite sources? What are your favorite places to read your own news? Read news outside of your own. TikTok. <laughs> your own uh, I, reporting. I, I watch... Uh, uh, Norm and I were just talking about this. Norm McLeod, our executive director at ACMI, uh, I watch MSNBC for about 15 minutes. I'll watch CNN for 15 minutes. I'll watch Fox for 15 minutes. Then I get angry and I turn it to TCM to watch Casablanca. Uh, I'm always online. Uh, the New York Times, The Globe, um, every now and then the, the Washington Post. I read it more, obviously, when I was on Constitution Avenue in my last job. but. Um, I, it's just a mishmash, and it's interesting to read, and I'm sure you can opine on this as well. When you're reading an article about a specific subject, it's like, okay, now I'm going to go to this network and hear what they have to say about the very same thing, and it's entertaining. Mm. Um, but I, I everywhere, pretty much, I'm, I watch TV. I, I, like I said, seriously, I get mad watching the three networks. I'll go to the BBC because at times I think they do a much better job of reporting about America than they America do. does. They do. Um, they do. BBC does an excellent job. And what's the German? I think it's uh, what, DW. I think it's uh, the, the, I think so, yeah. the Deutsche Zeit. Yeah. Great network. It's like, this is what I want to see. I want to hear about Ukraine. What happened in Ukraine today? What's happening in Taiwan today? Uh, I, I know I can't. If I watch Fox, I'm, I'm yeah. going to wind up watching Humphrey Bogart. Yeah. So. Uh, it's a mishmash of everything, but I, I think that's good. The more you read, the more you're going to be able to come to the conclusion that, okay, this, this paper is full of it, and that, 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 that website is full of it. This one's pretty much on. But um, I think that just the more you can absorb and the more platforms you can use, the better off you're going to be as far as being informed, like overnight parking. Yeah. There you go. I um I do the same thing. I also set a Google alert for Arlington, Massachusetts. Mm -hmm. So if an article comes up, then I'll get a Google alert, and I'll be like, "Oh, something's happening in Arlington." So yeah, usually it's your your article. <laughs> <laughs> it's, yeah, it's true. Yeah, I get mad when this thing dings, and it's like, "All right, what's happening? The world is ending. What's going on?" You know, the surfing squirrel died. It's like, why am I getting this stuff? Why am I getting this stuff? So I read the Globe and watch PBS. Oh, there you go. go. And they have longer stories. They do. They do. Yeah, they do. All right. Have a question? Are you going to ignore your question? That was our, that was, yeah, yeah. beat me to it. That was the next step. That's exactly, that was my last question. And then I was going to ask if anyone in the audience had any questions. Well, I got one. Great. Okay. <laughs> I read the uh, Yolo Arlington every day. What about Patch? Sorry? Patch? I don't read the Patch. Well? Should I be reading the Patch? Sometimes. Okay. And aside from that, what are the sources of news in this town? I get email 
comes from uh, the town itself. Mm -hmm. And I, I feel like there's something missing. Now, if I didn't have you around, then I don't have anything. Yeah, I, I, is the number one news source. We, uh, and I often wonder about what happens with Syria if we do not have computers now. I have to have a computer, especially next time I have travel. We have a weekly newscast at ACMI that touches on all, all the topics of uh, that we can cover uh, visually. Um, what are you saying? We have a newscast. It's a half-hour newscast that we tape. We're going to be taping the, the latest one. What is that half-hour newscast? Uh, seven, Norm? Seven, seven o'clock? Seven thirty. Yeah, and it depends on what uh, cable channel you're on, but you don't need a computer for that, even though we do have a Facebook. So you say you have a news source on TV? Yes. Yeah. Is it public? Yeah, yeah. We we put it out mm -hmm. town wide, and it's on Facebook. It's is also it on YouTube. Right? Is that on public? Ooh. As much as it, we possibly can. It's not daily. No, it's no, but uh, the. Yeah, I think you just put that. Oh, daily. And, and do you have actual? I can see it once in a while. Do you have actual local stories? On yeah. Oh, we we do every time. Yeah, we did the uh, parking of uh, uh, the the meters uh, <laughs> last week. Um, Oh gosh! This yeah, week yeah. I I talked to Greg Christiana a, a preview about the town meeting. Uh, we have a preview on that. Um, yeah, we uh, Ted, when they do have newscasts that relate to stories I'm doing, I am embed the video right in the right in the story. Okay. So way, I want to make one comment. I do. I would not read the facts of the Levinson Police Department. They have all the nasty comments that all the other social websites have, mm. and. Thank you, Bob, for not allowing that on your site. You know, we, when I read the facts, I sometimes see all these nasty comments which can divide this whole country. Oh, that and has. That's why Trump got rid of it. It has. And here you got the facts putting all that stuff on there with people saying, I don't like you, I don't like you, is this what it's overwhelming? It's terrible. Well, I was mad at Bob that day. That's why. <laughs> <laughs> No, no, we're not with a patch. I'm, I'm patchless. No, I'm, I'm, we're good. But uh, we were talking about this when we were previewing yeah. this uh, this event, mm -hmm. and we were basically saying, uh, uh, it's basically my thought. You can speak for yourself, but if you have nothing but friends and, and you're a journalist, and no one dislikes you, and no one is criticizing you, I don't think you're doing your job. Mm -hmm. And I, we're not looking for trouble. We're not looking for enemies. You're just they're just going to gravitate towards you if they don't like what you said, and it's just an acceptable part of the job. Well, I'm going to tell you this, that I'm working with a bunch of seniors now at the community center. They're exceptional. You should get known about the old army because they don't know where to get their news from. Mm. Well, maybe we should uh, take a trip over there and uh, talk to some of the maybe folks and, and fill them in. I'd love to give them a sample of what we do. Well, we are going to, you know what? You asked a great question. We are going to have uh, an open house next Thursday at 3 and 6 at 85 Park Ave. You'll be able to see the newscast come together. You'll see the stories that are going into to that, um, how we operate our social media, which is updated daily. And, and you'll get a tour of the station. Uh, but we'd be more than happy to have anyone who is curious. So we have the pamphlets in the back, and it gives you the times, who you can contact if you have any questions. And that way, we can invite suggestions from you as to how we can do our job better and cover Arlington the better. The thing I might suggest, if I could be brave enough to say that, maybe you're going to have to repeat the news more than once a day or say half hour. Norm, expand that budget. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I would love, you know what, I'd love to do that because I, I mean, I come from the world of daily uh, news. I, I did it for decades. So, um, and there are times when I know we're going to be taping our newscast on Thursdays. And I have a great story on a Monday or a Tuesday. I'm going to get it out immediately on our Facebook page, which Katie Chang in the back behind that camera taught me how to use. So, but we're 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 expanding, and it's baby steps. But we're we're getting to where we want to go. But we're we have we have a long way to go, and we're looking forward to to getting there. But come to the open house, and I invite everybody to. Mm -hmm. Bob, come to the open house. I know at least 100 seniors at the community center, and I'm willing to bet you there's more than there's not more than 50 percent of them that I. Mm -hmm. All right, road trip, road trip to our place, and you know what? I would love to go. I would love to go talk to everybody there too, just yeah. to let them know what we're talking. Bob, I mean, you could, Crystal, everybody's invited. Right. <laughs> but seriously, that way we can show you what we're about, and we can take suggestions. I'd like that a little Q and A and hear what uh, what's going on. So I, I invite that. I'd love I think that. You ought to. Yeah. I can tell you that the seniors in this town, the ones that I've contacted, and I see a lot of them because I'm very involved with the community center. Except for your Arlington, they don't know what to do. Yeah. No. Except for 
quickly not the ball. Well, you've given me an idea. I appreciate your question. Oh, yeah. Interesting. <laughs> All right. Do we have, we take one more question? Hello. Um, my name is, my name is Jonathan Struva. Um, thank, thanks to the friends and the Robert Barber for having this wonderful program. I hope, hope you have something like this again. And I have a couple questions. Bob, Crystal, and um, Jeff, um, how long have you known each other? Oh. <laughs> Not that long. No. Yeah. No, I bet I, she I've known one of the region. Chip, uh, a couple of years. Yeah. But, yeah. but just we recently. Just, we just met. Yeah. And we were, you, you've we interviewed in me event. on other stuff. Yeah. Yeah. We, yeah, yeah. I did stories. Uh, yeah. When did you go to Emerson? I graduated in 2005. Okay. I used to teach there. Really? Yeah. Nice. But in the 90s. Oh. Okay. Okay, so maybe you know Bob Ward. He, I think he went in the night. I know that name. Bob Ward. He, he's a number seven. I never knew that. Yeah. Oh, I've, I know Bob Ward. <laughs> <laughs> See that? Look at that. It's a it's a close knit business. Here too. Yes, here. yes. A lot of us went there. Yeah. <laughs> my, my second question is: Do you, do you ever do stories on a channel like Crystal? Do you think um, you um, will and and Fox News would do a story um, next Thursday? Um, about um, AGMI news. Oh, you just pitched it. No, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> well, well. What's your answer on that? No, yeah. <laughs> I'll have to ask my producers about that. Yeah, I think I think it would. Be, I think doing a local t a piece on local TV, I think is um, uh, would be really good. You know, it's so funny. There's a phrase that says like you cover the news, you don't become the news. So a lot of times we don't. Do stories on each other. Don't want to. Don't want to become the news. Yeah, yeah. No, that's happened once or twice, and yeah, it's like it's, yeah. it never ends well. Yeah. And, and Jeff, do you, have you ever interviewed Bob? Um, yeah, Bob and I were talking about the Arlington uh, paper. Uh, Bob came into our studio, and uh, it, it happened to be, I guess, it was a Thursday or whenever it, it, the paper, because we were given the paper that day, and it, it arrives Thursday. And I'm looking at the headline. Oh, the, the advocate. The advocate. Yeah. The, yeah. And it said something about money being raised for an amusement park, Edaville. And I remember talking to you about that. That's and right. you were just starting uh, your Arlington. And uh, Bob was basically saying, you know, we could use underwriters, things like that. I said, well, maybe somebody from Edaville can, you know. Yeah, yeah. Right? <laughs> but we had a, There's a local angle. Yeah, they, <laughs> but, um, yeah, no. Uh, I've interviewed Crystal. I interviewed you with the Martin Luther King birthday celebration at the uh, and, and for a few other events, too. Yep. But, uh, with the Black. capital, the Capital Theater for capital the theater. AIFF. Yep. So yeah, well, and we appreciate what, what I mean. We respect obviously what everyone else does because we kind of know what everyone is going through. And I, I loved working in Boston when I would go out and do a story if it was a breaking story and meeting the com the the competition. Yeah. And they were always they were helping yeah. you out. You know, if you arrived late, mm -hmm. hey, the guy you want to talk to is over there. Uh, the house burned down. He's talking. The PIO is over there. And it's like, hey, thanks, because I know I'm going to be here first, and I'm going to give you the same information if you arrive second or third. So everybody knows what everyone's going through, and there's a mutual respect on different platforms, three sure. totally different platforms, which is, I think it's healthy. You know, uh, my, wa my wife is over there. Uh, we, we met at the Boston Herald, and... Uh, we would never give anything to the Globe. <laughs> <laughs> you from the Globe? Yeah. It's five miles that way. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you, everybody. Thanks for, thank you for, Thanks for coming. Thanks for coming. Thank you. And thank you again to the friends for all that you do for the library. Um, thanks for coming out tonight. <laughs>